What's up guys, it's Dalmat here and today we're going to be reacting to another what is going on with shipping video. So this one we've got one about a hurricane, but it is not one of the two most recent hurricanes. So this is from about three months ago and it is Hurricane Barrel scatters ships across the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. Impact on the supply chain. Uh, so yeah, this is the one that went from... Uh, it kind of like came up the coast of uh, like northern South America and then like into like Mexico uh, slash uh, Texas. But anyway, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. On today's episode of What's Going On with Shipping, Hurricane Burl scatters shipping. I'm your host, Sal McCogliano. Welcome to today's episode. So Hurricane Barrel has been upgraded to category. One thing I like is how he always has a little dot on like the thing of where he's talking about. The Lego Five. looks pretty cool. The last time we had a Hurricane 5 in this early in July was back in 2005. And that was an epic year for hurricanes. But what I want to talk about today... Was Katrina 2005 or was that 2004? is the impact this is going to have on global shipping. This is going to have a massive impact on people living in the Caribbean, on the Yucatan Peninsula, throughout the region. It's going to be horrific. But I want to talk specifically what this does to global shipping because going through the Caribbean, through the Straits of Yucatan, and into the Gulf of Mexico is going to disrupt shipping, particularly bulk carriers carrying grain and ore, but also oil tankers, product tankers, liquefied natural gas, liquefied petroleum gas, you name it. It's going to have a massive impact on shipping. And if this is just the first in a very long hurricane season, we may receive repeats of this throughout the year. If you knew I mean, which ob <clears throat> obviously we, uh, yeah, now we've had two of the worst hurricanes in a long time hit back to back in Florida. And, uh, the one that ended up hitting Southern Appalachia, um, Oh, I can't. I'm already forgetting the name of it. Uh, it was it was just like a couple weeks ago, but the, because of the cold front that hit right before the hurricane hit, they ended up basically getting a massive storm, and then the hurricane it was like nonstop rain for like a week, and they got like a th the highest flood waters in like a thousand years, which is crazy. Channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So this is the Weather Channel's reporting on Burl as it becomes a Category Five. It is sitting right now just south of the Dominican Republic in Which Puerto Rico smoked. between the northern coast of South America. It is on track to make landfall across the southern end of Jamaica and then hit the Yucatan Peninsula and then into the Gulf of Mexico. This is the National Weather Service's map that shows you that in a little bit more detail this track seems to be pretty steady they have it going almost due west a little bit west northwest until it hits the yucatan peninsula then it spreads out but the map i want to show you is this one this is from marine traffic and marine traffic is tracking this hurricane as it comes across and what you're seeing there are wind patterns really the uh, the extent of wind out from the hurricane excuse me but what is important here is the impact it's going to have on shipping. So we throw shipping into the measure here and you can see the impact. So you can always find oh, yeah, everyone's avoiding it. easily on marine traffic. It's usually a dark hole with ships all around it. And that's what you see right here. This is the current position of Burl heading east, uh, uh, excuse me, heading west, uh, northwest at this time. And you'll see the ships scattered all around it, filling in the backside of it. You'll see ships cutting across the path right now. This is the major traffic lane. So up here is the Gulf of Mexico. And all the red dots there are tankers. And you'll see tankers coming out of Corpus Christi, Houston, Beaumont, off the Louisiana fields, all tracking down here between Yucatan and the western end of Cuba on a track line heading for the Panama Canal. And Burl has the potential here to temporarily sever that line. And when it cuts across here, what you'll see is ships piling up here in the Gulf of Mexico and, and over here waiting for Burl to get across. Now, ships are very unique in that they can move. They can evade from a hurricane. And ships will have access to weather data. They have ship evasion and weather routing map services that provide them this data. What's the best track lines to go to go hurricane burl is going to throw out a lot of wind it's going to cause a lot of waves and shipping is going to be able to avoid it and what ships are going to do if burl stays on this track is hang north of the track line wait how fast are these ships like are, are they quick enough so like you, these 
You have 45 hours out, 69 hours out, 93 hours. It, obviously, you have some that are making the trek across right now. Some of these are just getting in here, so I'm assuming they can make it across this easily within that 45-hour period. For this hurricane to go, what they don't want to be is in a position too close to the track line and it swerves. In particularly, what they don't want to be is pinned between the hurricane and land. So they're always going to want an, inv an invasion tactic to go to. So uh, obviously they have the Straits of Florida here, the northern coast of, of, of Cuba, the southern coast of Florida and the Florida Keys but you don't want to get hemmed in there either. So shipping is going to be watching this very carefully. What the other element you have is you don't want to get too far south of it either. You don't want to be caught here and get hung up along the coast of Honduras and Nicaragua or down here in the Gulf of Campeche where there are a lot of platforms. If you see right here, this is the port of Tampico. You can see all the oil platforms and rigs down here. They don't want to have vessels caught so the, in here. So are the blue rigs? They've got time. Um, you're looking at the time frame right here. You're talking about several days before that hurricane hits. So they're going to keep moving, and ships are going to be able to move several hundred miles in a day. And you'll see this traffic continue quite a bit up until the last minute. You'll see how barren the area is just in front of it but there are still ships that are going to be crossing you'll get the last vessels in and out of jamaica you see vessels coming out of the dominican republic Puerto Rico. man this guy's like right on the track rico right now but the key thing is going to be this route right here that connects the gulf of mexico to the panama canal so i changed up marine traffic again what i'm showing you now is all u.s flag deep draft vessels so one of the things that potentially happens here is if this hurricane is taking a beeline into the Gulf of Mexico, you're going to start seeing oil platforms offshore start to shut down. You'll see refineries start to shut down for fear that the hurricane may be coming into that area. What that means is they're going to have to disperse the oil tankers that are out here at the massive anchorages waiting to get into Houston and Corpus Christi and off of Louisiana. Now, it's really important to understand the context of hurricanes when it comes to American fuel distribution. So if all of a sudden you start shutting down the uh, refineries in this area, that means you're not feeding into the pipeline system. And we're going to talk about pipelines here in a second. The other thing is some areas are not serviced by pipelines. So, for example, the state of Florida does not have pipelines into it. It is serviced by tankers coming out of Texas and Louisiana and delivering fuel to ports on the west and east coast of Florida. And if this hurricane comes up here into this region, it could temporarily disrupt the flow of tankers to that region, meaning that you would not have the normal flow of tankers in. Now, there are storage tanks and facilities in Florida for this reason, so that you don't have to all of a sudden panic and go fill up every last container you have full of fuel. This is a consideration that goes into effect. What you're seeing right now is a lot of tankers moving very quickly to fill up the storage facilities in Florida to make sure that there is fuel on hand. At the same time, the pipelines are going to be pumping at full capacity. So this is the pipeline map system of the United States. You can see how that network comes together here all the way on the southern coast of Texas, up to the offshore. Is, is there a bunch of oil and shit up here? I knew there was a bunch, like obviously everyone knows about like the Texas oil fields and stuff. And then I was aware of a bunch in Alaska and I knew LA had some, but I did, I, is this because of how dense the population is here? Or is there actually a bunch of oil up in the Northeast? Platforms here in Louisiana and then out into the United States. This thin one right here, that's that colonial pipeline, the series, there's uh, it's actually uh, twin sets of pipelines that run up here. That is a key pipeline. It goes all the way from Houston, Texas, up into New Jersey. And that line up into New Jersey is key. Now, if all of a sudden the platforms and the refineries have to shut down, that means fuel in this pipeline is going to shut down. However, there are tank storage facilities up and down the pipeline here. As long as that pipeline can resume flowing within a set period of days, there's no danger. There's no concerns. The biggest concern, believe it or not, is not commercial and residential. 
people buying fuel, it's the airports because the Colonial Pipeline feeds into airports. And the supply of aviation fuel storage is very short term. Uh, you have to keep a pretty constant flow of aviation fuel moving all the time. But there are a lot of facilities up and along the pipelines for storage so that even if the pipeline shuts down for a protracted period of time, you can get fuel out of those tankages for a good period of time. So it shouldn't create a massive uh, uh, consternation, but it will. Well, don't get me wrong. There will be panic when all of a sudden the announcement comes out, the pipelines are shutting down, and everyone will run to the gas station and fill up every container they have full of gasoline. And I mean, the worst thing is people never prepare for this, right? Like, uh, maybe it's because I grew up in, in Canada and we have, like, these, you know, these winters where, you know, it can get really bad some winters, right? Sometimes you're stuck in your house for, like, a, a half week or a week if you get a bunch of really bad storms back to back to back. But, like, growing up, it was always, like, you know, have a bunch of jerry cans full of gas all year. And then you, you know, once the spring comes, you try to use that stuff in, like, lawnmowers and stuff right away. That way it's not sitting around and going bad. Um, but, yeah, definitely, like, come wintertime, you've always got a bunch of extra gas laying around just in case, just in case you need it. And if everyone remains calm, which is a hard thing to do, I know, everything works out fine because then normal resumption has. And the way barrel is tracking right now, it looks like it's going to be impacting the Mexican fields much more than the Texas fields. If it goes across the Yucatan Peninsula, which would be terrible for the citizens of the Yucatan, it'll be a horrific event if a Cat 5 comes ashore across the Yucatan, it will disrupt that hurricane. As soon as that hurricane is out of the warm water, it falls apart, it gets shredded. And when it shows up on the other side of the Yucatan Peninsula, Peninsula, sorry, can't talk today, gets on the other side of the peninsula, it'll be degraded either to a level one, two category hurricane or even a tropical storm, in which case it will have a lesser impact on shipping. But you're going to see a disruption here. Understand what happens when this disruption takes place is it throws the cycle off. What do I mean by throwing it off is if there is a day or two delay of ships getting to the Panama Canal, that means the Panama Canal is not going to be having as many ships go through. Now, the Panama Canal has gotten water levels back up and it's resuming almost back to normal rates of flow. But you'll see right here off Panama, there are still ships waiting to get in. There are lines here to get in. You can see the number of ships waiting to go through. If all of a sudden ships cannot get into Panama, they start piling up on the northern side, that's going to create a problem. It creates a backlog, and that backlog resonates through the supply chain if ships are not going. If liquefied natural gas carriers can't get through, they can't deliver their fuel to Korea, to Japan, to China. If tankers can't get through, if grain carriers can't get through, if ships can't come out of the Panama Canal and get past this storm up to the Gulf of Mexico or over to the Eastern Sea. How many ships can go through the Panama Canal at, at one time? I never even thought about that, but yeah, like you, you see this little, when he was zooming in here, you saw that there were ships going both ways at once. I always thought of the Panama Canal, like I don't know why, but I always thought of it as just like a, you know, like a one-way street almost, that like you just take turns going each way, but that really wouldn't make sense, right? You would have to have at least two directions at once. I mean, I guess there's only really two directions to go through, but you'd have to be able to, otherwise it would just get backed up one way or the other, or it would be like, uh, you know, when there's construction in it, on like a two a two lane road, they have construction. How they just have the the guys at the stop signs, right, directing traffic back and forth, and you take turns, and the lines get longer and longer and longer as the day goes on. I wonder how, uh, how, how like how much traffic can go through the Panama Canal at once. Keyboard that creates a problem. Uh, tankers don't want to divert all the way around Cuba and come through the Leeward or Windward Passage. That's a long voyage. They don't want to burn that extra fuel. And so ship companies are going to be playing a little bit of, you know, Russian roulette here, waiting for the last moment to tell ships which way to go. If they have to evade, they will evade and they'll burn the fuel, but they rather not. They rather wait for the last minute, have the hurricane go past, and then you'll see a flood of ships come through. Burl is tracked to be basically cutting across the path in about two days. And so in about two days, we'll take a look and see what impact this is having on disrupting of tankers and cargo ships across the area. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos. 
as it comes out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You hit the super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon and become a monthly or yearly subscriber. Thoughts and prayers are out with everybody in the Caribbean who is dealing with Hurricane Burl. This is a monster of a hurricane. Cat 5 is something you don't mess around with. Get shelter, get out of its path if you can. Uh, this is not a great beginning to this season because what I worry about is that really warm weather. This hurricane not just only became a Cat 5, it became a hurricane further east than any other hurricane we've recorded. So this actually happened off the east coast of the west coast of Africa. I remember hearing and about it this. It curled up and it grew all that strength as it came across. That is not good. That means that water is really warm, a lot of energy. That energy is transitioned over into the sky, into the hurricane, and then that energy is exerted onto land and onto the sea, and that's where you get havoc. Hopefully people get out of the way, ships get out of the way, ships riding through a Cat 5 hurricane is cataclysmic. Uh, let's not forget what happened to El Faro back in 2013 that found itself in the midst of Hurricane Joaquim, and that was a much smaller hurricane than what Burl is today. Ships cannot get in the path of hurricanes. They need to avoid it. I sailed through the back path of a hurricane one time between a hurricane and a tropical storm and took the biggest roll I ever had on a ship. 51 degrees. A 51 degree roll. A 51 degree roll means it's better to stand on the bulkhead than it is on the deck. That's what that kind of roll means. Yeah, you damn. don't want to be anywhere near these hurricanes when they come through. So next episode, the South signing off. Yeah, that does not sound fun. Uh, so yeah, even though these, these videos are you know a couple months old, this one three months old, I, I still really like watching them. You know, obviously it's not the you know being this far behind on them is not the best for keeping up to date on exactly what's happening. But I always find it interesting just understanding more about the logistics going on behind it because it, it, I find something very fascinating about logistics, just you know how society, how industry, how nations function. Um, because it's not a lot, it's not stuff that you generally think about a lot, right? And, that, and until you're presented with the information, and then you're just kind of like, oh, yeah, I guess that that is kind of bad or that is kind of cool or, you know, depending on the context of what exactly you're talking about. But anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.